Um, so to so move moving through, get my my mouse in order here um, with survey results. So um, many people reference the survey results through um, through the presentation, and these were the survey results, the parent results from our last survey. So we had um, a very nice response of 1,746 uh, responses from the late the last survey. And within that, some of you referenced 70%. 70, 70%. Um, throughout the surveys, we were pretty consistent with about 70% wanting some type of in-person instruction. So I, I don't think you're completely off with that, but it looks like we're looking at about 25% of parents who requested virtual. You have the hybrid that's split, that's just the alphabet side. So you're looking at about 35% there. And then of course you're 40% traditional. I don't know why my mouse isn't working. Um, within the survey data total, um, to date, the district had over 5,000 responses to our three surveys. We sent them in June, July, um, and then again, the end of July, staff surveys, and questions were including return to school options, transportation, and mental health and trauma screening. So some of you have asked, what's changed since June's recommendation? If you recall back to June 30th, um, we were in a different climate in June 30th, and um, it looked like the majority of, of districts, and uh, we were on a, a good trend with that. Um, our three to six feet, again, that was the suggested guideline from anywhere from the WHO with the three to six and the CDC being the three. Um, we're getting more scientific data. Uh, with the six feet and also three other very important things that have happened since June 30th. Um, 48 hours after the June 30th meeting, we had the Allegheny County Department of Health July 2nd restrictions. So the ACDOH, the Allegheny County Department of Health is that acronym. On then, um, so which you're familiar with that, on July 17th, um, we received another um, more restrictive order within Allegheny County. Um, those two orders trump the states. So it's important to know that when the county puts measures in, those override the state's orders. Um, so that's something important that we need to take note of. Also, we saw um, an increasing triple digits of those positive cases that increase through there. Um, PDE uh, dashboard was released on Monday. And uh, we have been asking for uh, districts for quite some time. So we were very pleased to receive the guidance on school reopening. And this guidance will help us in collaboration with the Allegheny County Department of Health to make determinations for reopening and selected instructional models. Amongst this, this guidance that I will share more with you in one second, we will also be looking at student attendance staff attendance, compliance with our, our students and staff with PPE, and of course, a district COVID-19 positivity rate. Those are just some other variables that we will look at um, as we continue down this road. Um, and it is, it, it is a, a journey that we are embarking on together here. Um, as recommended from PDE, the district will review every two weeks. I believe a parent asked, how frequently will you review this? We had um, a webinar just yesterday, and the recommendation was to review at two weeks and based upon trends, make determinations in a shift quarterly. Now, naturally, if there's an immediate need for a modification in school status, the district will not wait until the end of the quarter to do so, uh, but we will continue to monitor those. And communication on trends, we will, uh, will be projected monthly with this. And if you see my caveat, I really, these guidelines were just released um, on Monday. So I anticipate this process evolving as we move through the school year with this. Um, here is the, the metrics that you'll see. So determining instructional models, you'll see that PDE released this and there's a link as well in the presentation to low, moderate and substantial. Um, some are the moderate and the substantial are the ORs and obviously the low is the and aspect of that. Um, these are the Allegheny County metrics um, from July. So you can see, obviously, it, it just validates that we were in that moderate um, metrics there. 
and their guides for that. Some guiding principles to keep in mind, and this was taken directly from the CDC site, that we have low risk, more risk, and highest risk. So I ask you all, what risk are we willing to go and embark with here? Because um, each carries that. Obviously, the remote um, is the lowest. The hybrid um, leads to the potential most face-to-face -face time, but it assumes moderate risk. And then traditional, or the full-time, assumes obviously the most, the most risk there. Um, another caveat from the Director of Health, Dr. Bogan. So some questions have been brought up. The Allegheny County Department of Health has oversight of county health, everyone in every place in the county. Um, if, they are, if they direct um, staff or students to quarantine, it's important that we all understand that is a legal requirement um, that, for that request. Um, quarantine and contact tracing is mandated and those don't comply with that um, have legal ramifications. So we have to, which is an important factor of um, seating and assigned seating. And as we go through this, so you know, when we have a positive case, um, the Allegheny County Department of Health, and I can get into this a little bit more clearly in a moment, but they will ask for who's been around that person within that um, six feet for 15 minutes consecutively or more. We have to give that those names and lists to that. Um, we're required to do so. Also, um, the Allegheny County Department of Health has the ability to close um, at any time with that. Um, so we need to make sure that just sort of where those boundaries are. There's mandates and there's guidance. Um, and this we have school reopening guidance, obviously the social distancing aspect. Um, no large group meetings or non-essential guests. That's a, an order there, reinforced with the Department of Health guidance. Um, face coverings, that was again an order and there's guidelines for implementing those orders. And those links are there for your reference as well. There's considerations for that. Uh, and the CDC I thought was very fair at saying there's benefits of both in-person and risks for in-person and virtual. Uh, we want to promote healthy behaviors, hand washing, hygiene. We can do this. We want to think about the social emotional. Another parent mentioned that, um, which was an excellent point we need to take into consideration. Maintaining healthy environments and operations, and then also preparing um, for when someone gets sick. So we have some learning comparisons here. Um, so we want to look at what's, what's the best one? You know, what's the full in-person? Obviously, we have the CV Cyber. Um, so we have, you know, we want to look at that capacity. We want to look at the positive for it. Um, there's guidance that says that students, if they're six feet apart, can remove masks for periods of time. Um, if you want to look at the, the hybrid aspect, if a student becomes positive, it will impact a significantly smaller number of persons um, that would need to be quarantined. So here's a visual with those mitigation strategies and that close contact. Um, so within that closer contact, anybody who's less feet, less than six feet, you would see that it would impact um, a significant amount of people with that. But having the ability to space out and making sure that we have those, those six feet, uh, the six feet guidelines there, you can see it looks substantially different. Um, so again, sort of the reason why we're trying to, to ease into this and see how, how we can do with that, with that appropriate distancing. Um, ultimately, you know, families will have two options here. Um, and I think that Dr. Slavic is going to speak to, to some of these aspects. Okay, so in our two options, we have obviously the hybrid and the full-time remote learning. With both of those options, students will have have the ability to be in synchronous or live learning. So teachers will schedule times with students to have full class meetings with all of the students. Also, they'll have time to where they can sign up for individual tutoring. They can ask questions all through virtual means. So this is for anyone, um, any one of the students that are assigned to these teachers. Asynchronous learning for both options includes students posting videos of them teaching. It could be outside resources. Um, it could be a myriad of things that would help a student learn. No? There goes. Um, 
Transitioning between in-person and remote learning has been a question that we've received from a multitude of parents um, asking, you know, what are we going to do if we need to transition between them? Hybrid provides that ability to transition easily to five days. So if everything turns out that the Allegheny Health Commission says, hey, you know what, things are looking great, our numbers have gone way down, and they make the recommendation that we go back to a traditional setting, then students can easily, because they're already used to being in school for a few days, they're used to those procedures about wearing masks, social distancing, that they can easily transition back into a traditional classroom setting with the appropriate precautions. Also, it offers those consistent experiences for students um, with, their, with the same teachers or similar teachers that they've been working with all along. So they're building those positive relationships um, that are essential to learning. It enables transitioning between all of our instructional models. So if students, if we go back to a traditional model with precautions, or if for some unknown reason, the state tells us we have to close down and go fully remote, students will also be ready to transition to a fully virtual learning environment after they've had experience with the hybrid. Again, providing families with a start the school year in full-time remote it provides that ability to seamlessly return in person through collaboration with administrators and teachers. So how did we get to this place? Um, you know, we've heard some concerns about from parents and community members that they want to know how has instruction changed since March through June? We have gone through some extensive planning. Uh, we started with an instruction committee that was represented by all departments in the district of teachers, administration, school board members, and even some community member input. We reviewed instruction from March through June. We looked at survey results about concerns that parents may have had, that students may have had. Um, any and all data that we could take from that time period, whether it was formative assessments of our students and their academic abilities, or it could have just been some feedback from our teachers. Um, we looked at that information, that data, we made some valuable changes that are needed to improve upon our virtual instruction. We also created remote guidelines, which I'm going to get into in a few moments, which provides some consist consistency with teachers and virtual classrooms. So parents will see the same structure for classrooms K to 12. The, if they have a student in the elementary school, they'll be able to log into the classroom and know exactly where to find things. And the same if they had a high school student, it will be the same information and consistent introduction and instruction strategies. Um, for number two, building level cyber committees. Teachers have volunteered to serve as virtual or digital or cyber classroom committee teachers who serve as professional development facilitators as the go-to cyber leaders for each building. And they also be creating ongoing professional development for parents, students, and teachers. Now, this, these committees are invaluable. I, I can't stress enough. Our teachers are doing an amazing job working with each other, supporting each other, knowing that they have, you know, there's a, there's a long race ahead of us. So um, they're working hard to create those templates and that information for everyone. And then lastly, that professional development. Um, we've been working so hard over the summer. Our teachers have participated in summer Google training. We have over 150 teachers participating in hours and hours of training. Uh, we've created tutorials um, that are recorded and provided to teachers to help them learn how to teach online. Our in-service planning for the next week is entirely planned around working in, in a cyber environment and also looking at trauma support for students who may be struggling. And our cyber committee is doing check-ins and support and trainings as needed throughout the school year. The start of the school year for the first two to three week plan of hybrid or cyber, um, our, our teachers are going to be entirely focused on where are our students since March. March through June was a very difficult time for everyone. And our teachers have to know that they can't start from where they normally would in August and September. So they will be evaluating students to determine their academic needs and making adjustments to their curriculum and their instruction to make sure that they're aligning instruction to every student's needs and you know, enrichment and remediation. They will be reviewing the CDC requirements or procedures that are taking place in each school building. So wearing masks, staying six feet apart, one-way hallways, you know, that used to be two-way hallways. They'll be reviewing all of that information. They will be navigating or the virtual classrooms with students. So students will get a hands-on tutorial of what resources they'll be using and how to use them. Um, navigation application of, of the virtual classrooms themselves. How do I find things? Teachers will be going over all of this information with students and with parents. 
And then lastly, the social emotional check-ins, just checking in to see how our students are doing. Are they struggling virtually? Are they struggling with hybrid? Um, what can we do to continue to support them? Uh, when we go to start school and the assessing student academic needs, there's just a list here of the assessments that we utilize when determining um, where our students are in comparison to the curriculum. Um, classroom diagnostic tool is created by the Pennsylvania Department of Education, and it's really aligned to all of the standards that we use when we provide instruction. So we'll be able to tell immediately where our students are and what their needs are. Again, star assessment, similar procedure. Teacher creative formative assessments or assessments that are given every day throughout the week to determine how kids are doing on maybe smaller lessons. And then in grades K through two, our typical um, assessments like a cadence and again, teacher creative formative assessments. Once we have all this information, we can take those assessment results from 2021 and then compare them to previous years to determine are our students making progress throughout the school year. We need to know, are these hybrid courses, are these cyber courses, are they working? And if they aren't, we'll be able to quickly make decisions about curriculum adjustments. In order to evaluate the success of virtual and hybrid classrooms, um, not just the comparison of all of the data that we just talked about for assessments, we'll also be looking at student grades. How are they performing in their classes? We'll be looking at attendance. Are they participating? And also you know, looking at discipline tracking. Are our students struggling overall? And what can we do to help them along the way? Administrators will continue to do walkthroughs to review instruction and participation. Um, we use the Danielson framework, which is the Pennsylvania Department of Education required evaluation system for teachers. Uh, this is, you know, we're really looking at planning, classroom environment, instruction, professional responsibilities, all of these areas when we're looking at online classroom environments, which in all reality is actually a little easier to do than being walk, doing a walkthrough in a physical classroom because all of the information that we need to look at is already listed in the virtual classroom. Formative assessments daily and throughout the school year. And then as always, our parent, student and teacher feedback via surveys. The CVSD remote learning guidelines. This is, these are the specific guidelines that the teachers and the administration agreed upon to make sure that we're providing consistent educational opportunities for our students. So the goals are listed there, but overall, if you look at number one, is to provide teachers who are creating online courses with clear expectations for developing online courses. So we go back to, we are improving upon our instruction that's offered virtually versus when we had to shut down in March in an emergency situation. We are preparing, we are training, and we are moving forward. Um, lastly, I just wanted to show you a quick example of a Google Classroom in a hybrid setting. Um, many people have asked, well, what does this look like uh, when my child logs in? So when your child logs in, the first thing that you're going to see is this stream page. Um, and here, I just put a quick welcome video to show you just a snippet of what it would be like if a teacher recorded instruction and um, you could see a little bit more about this asynchronous instruction. You can see the teacher, or this is me right here, explaining the lesson. Hi class, it's Dr. Slavic. I'm so excited to finally meet you. So this short video. So you can see this whole video is going through and explaining what the classroom is like from the teacher's perspective and explaining it to the student and the parents. So at any given time, the students and the teachers can go back and watch this introductory video and really get a deeper understanding of how the classroom works. So the stream is mainly for announcements. Um, you can almost think about it when you were in homeroom and they had the daily announcements or what's for lunch today, what are we learning today, what are the activities? That's everything that goes on the stream. If you click on classwork, this is where those remote guidelines come into play. Um, some of the pieces are missing right now. I think there's a delay with Zoom, but there will be a, a information listed here that has the syllabus, that has teacher contact information, everything that you're going to need to move forward and know what's going on in your class. There will be a weekly calendar that will show you the week's assignments that the students will have to complete. So if we click on that, all of the K-5 teachers are utilizing this format. So as you can see, as a parent, uh, we had a lot of parents con express concerns that they need to know what's going on all week. So this particular week long plan, Monday through Friday, you can see this teacher saying that they have office hours on Monday. So students can sign up to have that one-on-one -on -one instruction or that support from teachers. 
These are the activities that the students will have to do. Then on Tuesday, they're going to have a virtual Google Meet, very much like this Zoom, a whole class meeting at 9 a.m. And they are going to go through all of this information as a class. All of the students will be able to see each other and the teacher, and the teacher would provide instruction. Wednesday, again, you have all your classes listed. We're going to talk about homework, and you can see how the rest of the class goes. So that's just a quick example of the week-by-week -week outline that parents would receive. And then when they go to pick the actual day of instruction, they click on the day and then all of the directions for that day's activities are here. So let's say I am a hybrid student. I am physically in class and Dr. Venata is remotely accessing the class. As the, when the teacher comes in, the teacher is going to automatically place this information right in front of you on the board. And the teacher is going to go through and actually play this welcome video for the students that are in the physical classroom or me. And Dr. Venata can watch it at home whenever she's able to do so. We'll talk about that video if we need be. Uh, but then we go to the second one, getting to know you. We would click on the form. We would go through the students who are hybrid or physically in the class would respond to this. The students who are remote would also respond to this. So you're getting, everyone's getting the same curriculum, the same information. Um, they would go through these videos, um, a, more information on Google Classroom, homework directions, and then they would complete an exit survey. But I go back to every student is doing the same thing, whether you're hybrid or you're cyber. The difference is that the students who are hybrid can possibly, the teacher will be able to, at that moment, provide that additional support. But when the students who are remote come back into the district, that teacher can do the exact same supporting strategies that they did on Monday, on Wednesday and Thursday. So overall, that is the hybrid and the cyber learning. Great job, Doc. Real nice. So we've had um, you know, significant so grading practices and attendance practices. Uh, last uh, spring, uh, to shift gears back to this, we, we kind of went off the normal grading scale um, and report card scales. Those will return um, regardless of remote or in-person. Attendance will be taken daily regardless of remote or in-person. Um, attendance will most likely be taken through the district's in student information system, Infinite Campus, and directions will be posted on that and communicated out. Um, that was just an additional feature that Infinite Campus added to that. We've invested, as Dr. Slavic stated, we've invested um, with technology and professional development investments. Um, a parent asked about um, devices, K2 iPads, three through 12 Chromebooks um, that we'll be rolling out with them. Obviously we're six through 12. Um, the iPads are here, we're waiting for cases. Um, so that rollout for K2 may look a little different and the, the Chromebooks for the intermediate school children as well. We'll be sending out communication for that as those should be coming in September, October. It was an unexpected delay um, with those, um, but we can mitigate that with those who need them. Um, I think Mrs. Franzik is sending out communication with that. Screencastify, video and conferencing applications, um, G Suite Enterprise, professional development for teachers, um, Schoology professional development, and then of course online and brick and mortar best practices. So going over health facilities and transportation. Um, so thinking about symptoms and exposure for symptoms. So the Center for Disease Control as well as uh, the PA Department of Health is not recommending mass temperature checks in school. Those have been questions that have come to us. Um, and that is not a recommendation that, that, um, that they're putting out for us. Uh, we will ask that parents will complete those health checks um, and staff as well. And this is the symptom screener for that. A symptom screener um, asks for group, if one or more symptoms from group A or two or more symptoms from group B, B are found, then the student should be sent home from school or they should stay at home from school or the staff member at that as well. Um, there are applications, you can get these on your phones um, to do reminders of symptom checkers. Um, I've seen it with various teams using those. Um, and you can um, look at that and, and double check it. Various mitigation strategies for this. 
We've spoken about personal protective equipment. Obviously, masks are the gold standard there. And when are they permitted? Um, throughout the day, they are required. Um, there are instances where they're permitted to obviously take them off, eating or drinking, uh, seating at least six feet apart, engaged in an activity that's six feet apart, or um, when wearing a face mask creates an unsafe condition. Um, and this is directly from uh, PDE in the Department of Health do students with disabilities. Uh, children two years and older are all required to wear them unless there is a medical or mental health condition or disability. Some mit additional mitigation strategies. Um, additional, we have face shields, gowns, gowns gloves. Um, and then if sometimes if students who are medically fragile require additional PPE, if we need to keep those before we can update uh, documentation for that to be stored here. Hygiene, staff and students will be educated at the start of school year, as well as daily reminders from signs and forms of reminders of hand hygiene. Hand washing, as we've heard throughout this, is incredibly important. Additional sanitizing systems have been created at various places. Students and staff will also be given time to hand wash um, during various times throughout the school or hand sanitizer. Um, again, the importance of the six feet. Remember, we understand now that this is an airborne, a social airborne virus, and it is spread primarily through respiratory aspects there. Um, so that's another importance of that, uh, trying to maintain that distance. And keeping, um, obviously, masks on is a very effective way to mitigate that, um, maintaining or not maintaining the distance. Um, also, within the physical distancing aspects, uh, our classrooms um, have been, you know, should be spread out as much as we possibly can facing the same direction. This physical distancing allows for mass breaks um, all in online office and learning spaces um, visited by students. Um, we have plexiglass. We have um, we've put barriers up for those who are coming into our buildings. And then obviously, um, we can also have an eat in a large capacity locations. Um, when we can't distance for those large capacity, if there are too many, then we can employ other areas such as LGIs, gymnasiums, um, other places that will allow uh, for better distancing. Again, continuing this aspect, um, signage. Um, we've, when feasible, uh, at the elementary level, teachers um, in some aspects may rotate in. That isn't applicable for all specials, but for some. And then, um, again, activities that may require students and teachers to be closer. Uh, grade 5, 12 students have assigned desks and seats in their classrooms that aren't shared. This is important. So while we can separate, because parents have asked me, well, I don't want my child going into a dirty desk. Within a hybrid model, you know, at the beginning of a year, we have the ability, the K-5, that that is that child's seat. So we will have the number of desks in there, you know, 24 desks, for example. However, group Monday and Tuesday will have assigned seats, which will be different from the Wednesday, Thursday group. K-12 will also have assigned desks and seats that have limited number of students rotating through them um, that will be able to do that. I believe there was a question asked why, you know, why not have Wednesday as that day off for cleaning. Our facilities crew uh, begins at two or three and they clean late through throughout the evening and if not all night and in, in some of our buildings. Um, they're here throughout that time and speaking with our director of facilities and asked specifically, do we need that day? The response was no, we, we have the, the manpower on those those evening shifts to, to make sure that that happens. Um, so that was the rationale in doing the Monday, Tuesday, uh, the Wednesday, Thursday. Also try to take into account um, parent work schedules. And um, for those that may be working a modified week, perhaps Friday would have been easier um, than others. Um, again, continuing on this, um, gyms and recess. Students will be in small groups. Again, the assigned groups, it's very important. I referenced contact tracing earlier. Um, so therefore, the contact tracing is important with the small groups and knowing who the students and staff members are around. Um, music classes. Um, our department chair for music has done some, some great jobs and research on looking at uh, minimizing um, 
that um, the spread, the viral spread by using outdoor spaces, um, recording themselves playing and submitting, singing with masks or humming, um, using different types of instruments and balancing that. We've marked our hallways for directional arrows, again, using signage um, for spacing and hand washing. And then again, looking at unused spaces uh, when we can for those, those additional spacing for students. Secondary, um, it, we need to understand that if we're in a full return at any time, our computer labs and some outlying classes um, with higher enrollment may have closer spacing. So we're looking at minimal sections, but there may be times, um, if not in a hybrid section, that we, those students may be, uh, may be closer, especially those lab aspects. Um, and obviously, you know, spacing will be taken into consideration with that. Middle school locker rooms, um, we are not going to, an accommodation we made at the secondary levels not to use those um, for PE classes to try to eliminate uh, that spacing, spacing issue there. So going back on that, you know, it's important that we understand if this, if spacing is such a, a big deal here and something that is, is so important to us, then we need to understand where our spacing is. So in a full return, you'll see in the blue various buildings and I was able to, to go through and, and measure and again, um, you know, many principals assisted and our, our director of facilities and, and many facilities members assisted within this measurement but going through um, you know, a full return. And I specifically didn't say traditional return because a traditional return means that we've done nothing else, that we did not put any other measures in place. But a full return means that we intend to bring everyone back. So we need to look at you know, our spacing there. So what other things do we need to do? With the tables that we have, if we sit three students at them, then you're going to only get a three foot spacing. So how can we do that with kindergartens with that full? So we need to make sure that we utilize different tables, different seats and things such as that with full return. Five feet and one and two. Intermediate uh, five feet in all grades. And again, uh, middle school four to six um, and high school four to six as well. The lunch spacing you can see there, um, which is various measurements. Uh, within that aspect. Um, we can try to use other spaces to reduce how many students are in the traditional common space um, to space out even further. And other spaces may be allocated to achieve that. In our hybrid schedule, this is where you'll see the six feet, all grades. And we're, so we're hitting that mark and very close to that mark in the lunch spacing. And that helps us again um, with the quarantine and isolation. If you recall the image I showed you with the, the desks um, and who would be impacted by a quarantine underneath a six foot measure is much more than wouldn't be. So we're trying to keep as many students in school for as long amount of time and of course staff as well by having these mitigation strategies. So some questions that we've received, what's going to happen when a case becomes positive? So students who are found to be ill at school will isolate in designated areas in the health office. We have um, quarantined areas there until they're able to exit the building safely. Um, we'll have various protocol in place there. And in order for the person to be returned, the entire quarantine period must be completed. And then information needs to be documented to, the, to the, our school nurse within this. As of today, Positive cases require a 10 day, or if symptoms continue beyond day, 10 days, at least one day past the last symptom, and 20 days for immune compromise. Close contact requires a quarantine for 14 days from the date of contact. And again, close contact means within six feet for 15 minutes consecutively, even if masked. Um, some mitigation strategies. So I've been working with our department chair for nursing and what happens when a, a person becomes positive, when we learn, when the school is notified of a positive case, the district department chair, and again, this is our procedure and I'm sure we will evolve through it, but as of now, we'll notify Allegheny County Department of Health if they have not yet notified us. If the individual resides outside, again, we will still contact them. 
building admin collects lists of student staff within close contact and provides that list to the department chair. The department chair of nursing provides the list to the department of health. And then students and staff are then collaboratively identified for quarantine. Students and staff who have been identified for quarantine will either uh, be contacted by either to the Department of Health and or the school district via letter and phone call. And then the, the student can employ remote learning for the quarantine time or other extended times of absence. So again, what is a contact? Um, this is a nice visual here that explains what is a case, what is a contact, and what is a contact of a contact? There's been a lot of questions on that. So here's some typical classroom and signage. Um, so we have various classrooms here that have been spread out. Um, you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, the seating on the cafeteria tables, the horseshoe indicates where the children would sit at that time, appropriately spread out here. Um, you can see that there are some desks in classrooms, um, the high school, middle school, elementary, that have been spread out you know, within that. Um, or during a full or during a hybrid, obviously, you wouldn't have all of those desks full. Um, and during a full model, obviously, you would. Our labs will need to spread out differently with that. You can see traditionally, there's a traditional image there. And um, some of those uh, will be, those desks and chairs could be removed during. Um, a full return, um, obviously a hybrid, they will be able to space out appropriately there. Signage, so various things that we're doing um, to keep people safe and reminders to you know, wash hands, reminders for the masks, and then again, to please try to maintain your distance. We'll limit visitors and volunteers um, to the maximum extent possible. We will obviously ask them for a screen similar if you're entering someplace. Have you been out to a hotspot? Have you been out of the country? Do you have any, any symptoms, any signs for that? Um, other considerations that we've taken into consideration here. The use of shared materials will be limited. Um, shared materials will be disinfected with between uses. Um, and that is something that you know, the computers and things, we will have to be very conscious of, especially in labs. Staggered releases um, of hallways. Um, our secondary buildings are already relatively confined in houses, but we need to be mindful of that of the elementary. One student per locker, PE classes will engage in low risk activities, and then playground spaces um, to establish and maintain groups. Our facilities, things that we've done, changing up custodian shifts, using different disinfectants that are quick drying, installing hand sanitizers and increasing the number that we have increasing mobile, um, looking at in, hand sanitizing at entrances, um, building, installing plexiglass and sneeze guards in various areas, increasing ventilation, opening windows when we need to, um, and continually obviously using high grade filters there. Transportation, um, I graciously appreciate the fact that um, many parents said that they would transport their child to reduce ridership. Um, through rerouting, we were able to reduce ridership on many of the elementary runs going from three to two um, per seat there. They will have assigned seats on the elementary runs um, and secondary runs. Again, um, knowing where our students and staff, who they're around will be very important to us. Drivers and attendants will wear masks. Students will wear masks to and from school. Students will not be permitted without a mask. They forget it, we'll have some extra there sealed individually. Weather permitting, windows will be open, hand sanitizers on the buses, um, drivers and custodians to clean between routes. And um, we will ask that student bus passes will be prohibited unless in an emergency situation. Again, trying to keep, keep that together there. And the sign seating as I referenced. Our cafeteria procedures, all students are eligible for breakfasts and lunches, uh, whether we are in person or online. So that's important and there'll be more communication coming out about that to how they can sign up to get those lunches. We have floor markings. Um, we'll try to reduce cash on a regular basis. Again, the assigned seating there um, and sitting appropriately. So 
again, as, as I've mentioned, the school year start and recommendation and based upon that, that information, which I just shared with all of you as you sat through so patiently or listened to so patiently that the district at this time would recommend the hybrid. I don't think that is a surprise to anyone. There will be some calendar change proposals to reduce those Mondays off. I think another parent mentioned that as well. Um, there are some half days. So those um, will be moved to Fridays specifically, so they would not lose another day there. And then for some um, orientation and some presentations that that information will be posted on the website. So we're committed to, again, providing choice, obviously creating self-learning environment, safe learning environments, um, creating and, and offering that high quality CV curriculum instruction um, and assessment and attending to our students' social and emotional well-being. So I wanna thank you guys for everything. Um, and uh, again, these are just some conclusions that I have here. So I think I've, I've said enough for the, for the day. Thank you all. Thank you, Diane. Really great report, Doc. Really great, great report. Really great. Thank you. Thank you for any administration, Miss. Thank you all for your support. And uh, since I went out of order, I did a consent agenda. Sorry about that, folks. Um, we can move to the action items, discussion items, which, um, Sandy, I guess you're up for that. Here on how to unmute myself. Uh, the superintendent recommends an ISO move to approve the reopening plan for the 2020-2021 school year. Bob, so may I have a motion? Should I just? I have a motion, oh, may I have a motion for items 4.1? May I have a second? Any discussion on this item? Make sure you unmute, please. We can't hear you. Just a quick question um, on the hybrid. When will we be, just to make it clear, when will we be reviewing possibly going full? So great question. When will we review possibly going full? So as the guidance from PD states, looking at those trends every two weeks. Every two weeks, okay. Every two weeks, we're reviewing that. And I will update the board monthly as to where those are. If there's a reason to update before that month, obviously four weeks in a month, got that. So then that would be something that I would update you all on before okay. that time. Thank period. you, that's what I needed. Uh, I would ask that we start measuring to get six feet, especially in a middle school and high school, we spent 90 million. Uh, I think it's in high school, we have two gyms plus two upper gymnasiums. We have a lot of space, but I think we can get to the six feet. Um, we'll probably get that out of the community, maybe even four to two weeks, but that's just my opinion. Thank you. could you explain what the protocol will be for the Friday? What, what's going to happen on the Friday when the kids are not in the building? So they will be learning online on those days. So that'll be part two days in person, three days online. And the teacher will be in the building? Teachers are day. in the building five days a week. Teachers are in the building five days a week. All right, full day. Thank you. That's a question. So I, I'd like uh, everybody's point of view on this notion of mandate and what kind of, I'm sorry? Okay, sure, sure. I'd like to have a conversation about um, how we think about this notion called a mandate. And I'm not sure I'm convinced, and I've asked our solicitor, I've asked Don a number of times to outline for me what we are mandated to do as a public school, and I can't find a lot outside of um, guidances. So I'm left wondering who's making these guidance 
impositions on us and do we accept them? Recommendations. Their recommendations, their guidances. There's, there's an element of Allegheny County and the health department that is certainly a legitimate concern. The health department can at their will choose to shut anything down in Allegheny County. But as I have documentation from Allegheny County uh, Department of Human Services, they do not have jurisdiction over public schools, nor this decision. And before we go and make this decision, I just wanna make sure we process through all the options and not just the ones that everybody else has accepted. Because to Bob's point, what separates Sharpton Valley is $93 million of recent investment in our schools to get flexibility and space. What also separates us is our investment in cyber school. And so I wonder if hybrid and remote are our only options to consider, or should we be giving parents the option to choose full in-person learning and full remote learning? I'm particularly interested in those two new schools because it also happens to be where all the extracurriculars take place. We've decided as a district over time, time and time and time again, that extracurriculars are as important to our learning environment as is academics. I think our participation at the high school in extracurricular is extraordinarily high because of the breadth of offering. We offer so much to students to create the whole child. And I feel like part-time school and five-day extracurriculars is inconsistent for me. And so before we kind of roll through the hybrid option, I want to open up discussion for the board because I think our community has asked for it. They've asked us to process through this decision. So I'm opening it up for other conversation. Well, I think, it, you know, one of the things you touched on was um, the recommendations and the lack of mandates and um, and are we bound to adhere to those or, um, you know, the, the six feet. Um, it's interesting, a lot of, you know, several people that spoke asked about daycare and, you know, my kid's been going to daycare since May, you know, whatever they said, you know, March or May or whatever. Um, and it's interesting if they can function why we can't. And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I don't know if anyone does know the answer to that. Like, you know, are they strictly adhering to this? Is that why they can keep their doors open? Is um, I guess is they not be. Um, so, you know, is it more of a? Um, I don't want to say a fear. It's a. Um, you know, a, a risk that we're unwilling to take to say we don't want to go less than 60. Um, you know, to, to give people the opportunity to, to, to choose. If you say, I can only get you four feet in a certain area, will parents be okay with that and kids be okay with that? Um, you know, I, I know, and I know you're measuring, you know, doing additional measurements and and it would be really nice to get the middle school and the high school open for sure. Um, you know, I, I think we've, we've all discussed it, you know, or, or at least during different points in time, expressed our desire to get back to five full days as quickly as possible. So, I mean, I look I at it. Dialogue. I think coming out of the gate with the hybrid, you know, it is a good viable option. But certainly, I think the things we've heard on the calls and the conversation we've had, I mean, a lot of rounds, we're going to go forward, at least the motion is to go forward. Bob, can you unmute, please? We can't hear you. Now he froze. Oh, it's okay. I'm not, even, I'm not even on here. I'm talking all that time. Hey, sorry about that. So basically what I'm saying is I think our decision of, of, of 
recommending coming out with hybrid is a good idea, but knowing that as we're expressing around the table, uh, as a board, we are wanting to go back in a safe manner to full day, basically as soon as possible. And as we communicated, looking at it from a building by building perspective, especially since we spent $90 million or more of the taxpayers' dollars to give flexible learning space, creating common areas that we can now use for seeding and such. And uh, Johanna and, and, and the administration is wonderfully looking at that stuff, which is great. And we've heard some good recommendations on the phone, but I think we have to consider the conversations from the board members and the community. And again, we are concerned and we will make sure things are safe. If someone else has some conversation. I would just like to make some comments in general. Um, obviously, you know, nothing like this has ever been dealt to us before as far as an educational surrounding. Um, I want to really congratulate our staff, our administration, our teachers, uh, and our students for persevering through what, you know, is challenging uh, times, absolutely unforeseen, and uh, to come up with what we've seen tonight is an incredible game plan, I believe, to get out of, out of the gates and get these kids started with an educational process that will actually educate them. I think what we did in March, April, and May was reactionary and it was very difficult to do. But I think this, what we've seen tonight is something that can educate children. Um, with that said, I wanna know if there is a plan, if a parent wishes to send their child to school at the time, is there a plan that would accommodate that? Is there some, I mean, I, we. 40% of our population wanted to have kids in school full time. And for obvious reasons, as we heard tonight, um, is there something that has been considered, and I, I don't need an answer right now, but something to consider. Um, is there something that can accommodate those 40% of people if they want to send kids to school? Um, so, I, again, my hat's off to everybody. All the comments that we heard tonight were fantastic, and, and I understand it. I no longer have children in, in our school system that I put four through here. And it's a difficult, difficult place to be as a parent, as a teacher, and as a, as a school board member and administrators. We all are in a very difficult spot here, but uh, I'm excited to you know get the kids back to school and get the kids learning again. And uh, I just wanna thank everybody for your participation today. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. I think, um, so I, I, think I think from having a few fewer kids in the school in the beginning um, is a way to, uh, you know, change to traditional. I would, uh, unlike Eric, would rather see the primary and intermediate school go full time before the high school and middle school, because your hardest group that we've heard this evening is parents can't go to school because they need to educate their child and be home. But high schoolers can be home alone and should be prepared to move to a workforce that is more remote. Uh, and by doing that, uh, we're setting them up for success in the future. So that's why I would rather them uh, or us actually um, you know, work on the primary school and the middle school or the uh, intermediate school first to go back full time. But, but I agree with everybody. The whole goal is to just start school and then really evaluate the week of the 24th on how we can get everybody back because it's in everybody's best interest um, if they're taught by a teacher in a classroom. Uh, you know, and I'd, I'd like to thank everybody, you know, for working together, uh, both the school board and the administration for their thoughtful approach to tackling, the, you know, this ever-changing reopening of schools. Um, no one solution will be perfect, but the goal will remain that we need to safely return all these students to school full time. Uh, and as we 
monitor this COVID-19 conditions, uh, you know, it may change one way or another, but, you know, the community should know that we're striving to educate your child regardless of the obstacles we face. Uh, this year will be challenging for everyone, but I know that as a community will prevail because we'll work together in the best interest of our students. Uh, and it just will take some time. Uh, so uh, I hope everybody sticks with us. Uh, what I was going to start to say uh, before Darren talked, I mean, um, I think what might be helpful too for everyone that's listening in is, um, you know, because at, at first when I saw the survey results and, um, and so you look at those and you think, oh, it must be spread evenly across the buildings. But, um, but it was really interesting to see that, that that's pretty disproportionate. Um, there, there is a, a large group of those participants that, that don't want the remote or that don't want to come back in the primary, correct? I mean, it's it, in K through five, right? Um, and and very few in, in the high school. It was a very small percentage that, that want to stay remote. So it makes it challenging, um, you know, because you look at, there's two things, I think, in my mind, you know, it's the physical and the facilities, right? Can we get everyone safe in the distances? Um, and, and and for those six foot recommendations, and if we can't meet it, how long are the ch the children in those areas, or what you know, what are they exposed to in there? Um, and then also with that disproportionate um, survey result is uh, the, the the willingness of you know the other big key component is educators, and you need to have enough educators in the buildings to teach. And, and those have been our two biggest impediments is the physical and getting the number of educators back, commit to come back, correct? So, I mean, that's kind of the, the crux of what we've been dealing with here is it's not just as easy as just the measurement. It's also trying to get the staff and the educators back in the building. Yeah. Mr. Kramer, if I could add to that too, um, when we have to, when we would have to quarantine we may be taking out the educator as well, which will unbalance you know, our staffing and, and create another issue. So we need to be mindful of that. And that's something taken into consideration as well. How is that going to look and how is it going to unfold? Um, and again, I think the Department of Health is still working on you know, specific guidelines for us with that and, and creating this. Um, so it's great that you know, we have this initial game plan, but I envision us learning a lot as we go as you know and I commend all of you for the conversation we've had hard conversations this this past summer you know this throughout this entire time um, you know I, I don't believe a school board has ever been taxed with a responsibility such as this ever I mean, when, and when you all ran you you correct thank you Bob thank you I was trying to be gracious but thank no, no, that's, that's you yes. true. none of us have so we're, we're, again, we're building this plane in the air. And, um, but I do feel that we can do it together. And there are great suggestions and notes that, that you've brought up through this and that our parents have brought up through this that, okay, good, let's check into that. Let's look into this. Um, and you know, it, we'll learn a lot together, but you know, I, I appreciate everybody's, you know, everyone's time and commitment. Thank you, Eric. And I think it's not any teachers, it, I mean, we're going to have COVID cases. It's going to happen. Whether you're in a hybrid model, whether you're in a full model, and even if you're sitting at home and you're in CV cyber, someone's going to get COVID-19. Okay. So it's going to create the number of students in these buildings is going to change daily. The, the amount of teachers available. So all this is a moving target. That's why I think, you know, we're doing a nice job. We're coming out with this hybrid. Um, but I know we've, we've definitely voiced it to Johanna and the administration. Of, we want to get creative. We want to work hard. We don't just want to be in one of the other 22 districts or however many that say, oh, we're going to go hybrid and sit this out. We want to be proactive. We want to be safe. And we want to keep our community and what their wishes are in the forefront. Uh, so thank you.
So uh, just to add a, a little bit to that conversation, Eric, thanks for teeing that up. <clears throat> I think I start with, you know, who we are as a district, because every district has had to make this decision based on, you know, their values. You know, we're a common sense community that solves problems, we don't create them. We're looking for what is our way. And I think what we've come up with today is that our way is to try and get kids back in school full time as fast as is practicable. Um, to that end, you know, there's, there's data and Allegheny County came out with data. Uh, our, our issue and our concern is teachers. And last week, uh, Arthur Steinberg, who's the president of the Pennsylvania chapter of the American Federation of Teachers, was in front of the PA Democratic lawmakers. And he laid out clear metrics also that he said had to be met before reopening school buildings could be considered. And he expressed concerns over ventilation in school buildings. He said there must be, and he cited an incidence number of 50 cases or fewer per 100,000 people and a positivity rate of 5% or less and a reproduction number of one. Our incidence rate in Allegheny County is 50. Our positivity rate is 4.7%. And our reproduction number is 0.97, which is less than one. So as far as Arthur Steinberg, who's the president of the teachers union that our teachers operate under, we would meet his metrics. So I feel as though we have to be thoughtful about solving our problem our way. And I agree with what Tony said. I agree with what Erica said. And I think the idea of developing what we're going to use as our indicators, Johanna, is the, the right step for us. And then, you know, how do we get more creative about our space? We have um, contemporary ventilation and filtration systems in our two new buildings. Um, there's a lot going our way in those two buildings. I take Darren's point too. So now I'm kind of of the opinion that we really should be driving aggressively for all four schools to reopen in full. And I think now as a board, we have to take on the path of trying to figure out what those indicators are and, and at what point we move um, to do it our way. Just a quick comment, if I may. Um, I was, I'm still a big fan of opening all the way, but all of my colleagues here and myself, we've been involved in this, but nothing like our superintendent and her staff. You, you folks have been in the trenches from day one. And, and I think the program that you have developed this evening is, is just wonderful. And, and I can go with that. As long as we review it every couple of weeks, so I'm, I'm fine with that. I can live with that. Uh, just to clarify your comment, are you looking to aggressively open the buildings from day one or from the earliest protocols that we can establish that we should get the building ready? That's a great question, Tony. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really torn because I, I believe that our high school students deserve the right to align interests academically and extracurricularly. And I believe taking that from them, I, I think taking that from them is a hardship. And I feel badly about that. Had we seen something a little bit more in the data and I'm a, little, I'm a little frustrated that the only two pieces of data we got were the data focused on full, bringing everybody back, all the students recognizing that we likely won't do that. There's going to be CV cyber in all of our schools. And then the remote option. I would have preferred to give parents more context like if 75% of our students are back in this school or in this school or in this school, this is how much distance we're going to be able to allow. Short of having that clarity of data that teachers could understand and parents could understand, I don't know how we do that immediately. So I'm a little bit torn and I feel a, a little un, unclear without enough data points to really kind of lead the charge. But if 
all of us were of the same mindset and we wanted to take a shot at a school. I think Darren's got a decent point that it could be the primary school. And I think there's the other point that it's the high school. So I, 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 I could be open to that. And I, I'm super interested to hear what all of the board members think, because I think it's important for us all to be heard. <laughs> so that thank you for asking for that clarification brian so that includes it is it's very important so those spacing numbers did include those um 700 plus students now um yes the number has increased um over the weekend. Um, 36, the CV cyber. So that includes um, those students who have already been pulled out for that. Now, I would think that the, that number is going to fluctuate as we move through this process and continue to build this plane, whether and some may be committed all year, and that's fine. But there may be some that become more comfortable as we move through and we learn more, um, then, okay, yeah, I can, I can come back in now. We need to take that into account. So again, it's that moving target aspect, but those numbers do include that, but I need to be very realistic with them. Um, and I was trying to be as transparent as possible with that. So I would just say, if that's the case, then we should amend your chart that says full, full return average classroom space and to something that it is footnoted or it somehow reflects that that's inclusive of, of current. Um, right. So it did note it that there was C, include CV cyber, but thank you. Great, thank you. Mr. Hanna, can I ask you, um, I don't recall seeing it in the slide, but we popped through them pretty quickly. Is there a protocol in place for parents to be transitioning from one to the other? And, and what it, if you, what's that look like? Yeah. So that's a great question. So that transition, though we ask that people be considerate of that transition time to the best educational interest for their child, what um, some districts have asked to commit for a nine week, some have asked for a year. We ask that parents coordinate that transition time with their building principal. And it may be different for each student. And that's important to note that perhaps we can, you know, we're in hypothetically week seven, there's two weeks left, we have some, some end of the quarter exams and things coming up, can, can you wait till the end and do this? There may be another situation where no, it isn't, I, I need to transition either to remote or from remote, you know, as, as urgently as possible. So we need to take those, those matters into consideration. And we ask that they reach out to their building principal for that. Um, and I even, just through correspondence the past couple of days with Dr. Slavic and myself, some parents have reached out since we announced um, the recommendation of hybrid and said, I think, we wanna, I think we wanna come back and try hybrid. So at that point, there will be an opportunity for parents to then notify us and say, okay, so we can start the school year and we know which ones are asking to, to switch already. Um, and that'll be, it's communication, but I think that we can, we can manage that. I think just, just in case, because it sounds like there might end up like, you know, if X number, of, if X percentage of kids go remote and why stay here um, or traditional um, and the measurements work, but then a couple of these kids want to come back I mean, it sounds like there might be a situation where you, you're going to have to refuse that because if you, you know, if you've got your, your classroom laid out and you've got it maxed out to be at the six feet and someone chooses to come back, you, you may have to, I just want to make that known to everybody or, or unless I'm wrong, because if, if they're coming back to that class and now your measurements are not six feet or you're not, you know, it sounds like you might have to refuse it. I'm not sure if we would have that issue in hybrid. Um, and but if we go full time, then we're going to have to to look into that and, and see what we're doing. And again, we have in June there was three feet to six feet. And again, that's the furthest extent possible. 
Remember the risk slide. What risk are we willing to assume? Where is our community comfortable with that risk? And that's a legitimate question. Where are we with that? But I think it's important, and the second road you said too, that people know, and maybe I'm okay with three feet. And okay, but that doesn't mean that everyone may be. So that's something that we need to, as we continue to move forward and evaluate this, to then update, okay, this is where our numbers are now. This is what it's looking at per building. Um, I, I know that some spoke about building, whether it's high school or elementary, and some parents and as well as board members brought that up. This is a fast moving target. Again, Dr. Slavic and I were talking earlier and I said, I, that it's a scud missile every, in, in multiple ones throughout the day that we're, we're learning through this. So again, I know I may sound like a broken record, but you know, I appreciate the patience and the cooperation. And we, you know, as we, as we embark on this marathon, we'll see how, we, how it ends up. And we're gonna learn a lot these next couple months. We're learning from some, some schools in various parts that have done well and, and have not. We will, we will continue to learn from that and learn quickly. And after this meeting, I called the cyber numbers could go up and if we get cyber numbers up to like 30% or more, we very well could go the option to pull people in to do the math. Depending on what level that is. Remember, as Mr. Kramer pointed out, the online numbers are very heavy elementary, not heavy high school. You know, but so that's that could be, I don't want to mislead people that it is right. equitable um, because that may right. be an option at the elementary, of course. But school. at the high school may be different if those numbers are not high. You got up to 30%, I think, in high school, you'd be good too. And I, I was like, I mean, I, I appreciate you clarifying that because I was thinking full five day versus, and then if a person would try to come back, because you know, I'm, I'm not excited about the hybrid. I haven't liked it since we started talking about it, and I'm hopeful that this isn't going to last very long. We're going five days, so um, it, you know, that's why I'm thinking in the five day mode all the time. <laughs> Who's talking? Karen, they can't hear us, I don't think. Oh, uh, she she can look at every end, I have to say. Yep. Quick scenario, if the perfect two weeks go by, what happens? So again, so we wanna look at those trends for two weeks and various measures that we're looking at. So let's say that the county numbers drop into the low for those two weeks and we see how we're handling it um, as a community and a district and how this is working, then okay, um, our student attendance, our staff attendance, because that's telling. If they're not here, then there's an issue, right? That's why that's an important factor. Um, we're looking at, um, again, are they wearing the mask? Are we, how is this going? Um, and how have we been communicating with the, with the health department with that? Right. If those things are all in a good, and trending in a good plot, then clearly it's okay, where do we start? And I think that we would then start to look at which buildings we can start with, but that's um, something we need to evaluate you know, moving forward when when we see that. I mean, I could, because what I may say, what I've learned through this, everyone, is what what I say today very well can change tomorrow. So I'm very cautious and guarded to make a commitment to something right now when I have no idea what is around the corner, because I do not want to miss it. Yeah, I wasn't looking for a commitment. I, and I think as a board and uh, working with you, Dr. Venata, on seeing really maybe what matrix we're comfortable with. We may not want to go strictly by what Allegheny County 
recommends or guide us on. We may want to consider some other astute people in fields of healthcare, education, and such. And maybe there's some other, there's so much data out there and different approaches. I think it's good for us to look and not just consider Allegheny County. But um, I think we've all talked. Are we good? One more, because I want to yeah, get. Yeah, uh, I, I want. I would like to just uh, ask Dr. Venata one one more question. And and I I started out with, um, you know, what what you and, and Misty have presented in terms of of the approach, the mirroring approach that will take place between the in person learning and the online learning, the Monday through Friday and the Monday through Friday. That you know, if you're a Monday Tuesday, you're learning. Uh, remotely what the Monday, Tuesday kids are learning in class. And the Wednesday, Thursday is opposite and Friday then becomes the, the last remote day. So the fact that there's this mirroring going on, um, do you, can you envision a time, and, and I guess maybe I'll add one other thing. Um, the reason why I feel like we should be more aggressive is because of how much confidence I have in who we are and what you do. What a lot of people might not know, and what I've just learned of late, is how fearless you are as a leader. And if there was ever a time to have a fearless leader steering the ship, it would be now. So I want to push in behind what I think is capability and try to be as creative and as problem solving as we can. With that said, as I think about the mirroring, do you envision a time where we might have real ultimate flexibility? So if that's how we set everything up, at some point where we go to full, if there's still a parent that says, I prefer hybrid, and is there an opportunity to do a Monday, Tuesday in person and a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday remote? Could you envision a time where we could potentially offer those options broadly. So I believe Mr. Mazzarini asked that same question a little while ago. Um, and I made note of that. Um, so um, how, could we, how could we do it? And what would that look like? So I need, would need to look at all of our staffing models. And again, how, where would that balance be? Um, and how would it throw? So we'd have to have various, I would envision, various metrics in place to say, okay, we can absorb this amount um, and it would not negatively impact. Um, so that's a, that's a jigsaw puzzle that I need to, to look at and how could that come about? Because it, that's maybe a potential um, that pe parents would ask. So that's a potential ask of parents. So could it happen? I, I'm not sure yet, but I, let me look into it and see. Especially as we spoke about the primary school size and the survey results of that, especially with not having the population there, if that had also been probably the largest challenge to the parents as far as small children, they need to be in person to really learn more effectively. I think that looking at that model first would probably be something I think we should truly consider as quickly as possible. Thank you. I totally agree. You know, now with, you know, with knowing that the 700 plus kids or whatever that are on cyber, um, do we, do we meet the measurements now in the primary school? Okay. So the reason we can't open the primary school is staffing and educators. That's where the hybrid helps. Yeah. If you meet physical and facilities, then it only leaves one, <laughs> one other, you know. So that, you know, as we go through, and as Mr. Cora suggested, you know, the, again, the two weeks, really looking at these measures and seeing and looking at those, those plans. So, again, I, I'm drafting things here. And, and plotting and, and, and planning as we go through this. Um, but I have to, I have to baby step. Yeah. And that's, so let's, you know, take this and we will get, trust me, I, I know education as well in five days. Yes, I am not in disagreement of that. But we have to take other precautions 
um, in place so we don't uh, sabotage ourselves. You just want your daughter back in the school. Don't say that. I'm kidding. Right. I, I, think think I, I think when you talk to most of the kids, I mean, I, I, I've had trouble finding a kid that doesn't want to be in school five days. Um, you know, and I've talked to a lot of kids. I know this can't be their decision because they can't make the process, the data, right. and the medical ramifications and all that, but they really do want to be really? back. And the majority of the parents that I talk to want to come back. And it, you know, for the socialization, the education, everything. Um, so I think we really do need to get that. And, and it's interesting. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of people look at it at one angle, you know, COVID, that's right. it. Oh my gosh, it's a virus and we don't know what's going to happen. But it's not so, and I'm glad to see 400 people are still logged in and, and, and listen to the people say, you know, it's about, what do I, you know, childcare. It's about, what, you know, how do I educate these kids when I'm working on the front lines and I, and then I have to come home and try and teach too. And, you know, we're not all educators. I mean, I'm not. Yeah. Extremely frustrated when I have to fuck a bound with yeah. my going to be junior this year. Um, so I think we do have to listen to them, and I, I would really love to figure out a way to get that primary school open. Um, you know, and then just one other thing, because I, I, I don't know, I think maybe you addressed it in there, but I was taking a lot of notes, and so I might have missed some things, but. Did you answer the um, the cleaning day question? Okay, yeah. just because I know it came up a couple of times. Like, yeah, well, I, I can attest, I've been up uh, to the buildings. I walk up at the place and I've talked to some of the cleaning people. They're very, you know, they've done a nice job. Uh, very, very clean. Uh, I have to commend them. I mean, the, the, the maintenance people have been wonderful. Uh, absolutely. So, um, I do want to thank uh, my fellow board members, the administration. Thanks for the good discussion. I mean, I think this is very important. I hope the community uh, realizes how we're taking this to heart and we're putting the hard work in. And uh, we're here for you. And uh, so I think we've had discussion. So all in favor? Aye. Yep. I just was wondering, I mean, should we vote? It's across the board. It's not voting by building, right? I mean, or it's not. Okay, go ahead. I, I was just, you know, because I think, you know, listening and, you know, I, I think there's some that we have to vote the hybrid because we just can't do it. But I think there's others that maybe we should really consider it. You know? For all, okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure. So I think the takeaway there is, uh, when's our next board meeting? So we can address that on the 25th, possibly, to say, hey, and maybe have some type of vote on once we have building building information. Is that fair, Don? Does that make sense? It does make sense. The information that I can provide on the 25th. But remember the other metrics that we're probably going to include, we will not have because we will only have had one day of class. Yeah, we're not big on, recommend right. we're not big on recommendations. <laughs> the health department can change their mind three more times before our meeting. Right, but we want to talk.